Question 31. A Dow Jones ETF was $117 exactly one year ago. It is now at $128 and has paid a dividend of $3. The Dow Jones ETF's price return is closest to. So since it's price return, um, we need we can ignore that dividend. So that's one spot where we could have gotten tripped up on that question. So other than that, this is going to be pretty straightforward. Um, so we're just going to be taking that starting or sorry that ending price we had so that 128 will subtract the beginning price and then divide that by the beginning price of 117 pull in our answer here and see what that looks like so we've got 128 minus 117 over 117 gives us 9.4 percent so we'll go with b question 32 a project with an initial outlay of um, 10,000 pounds has the following annual cash flows over three years. We've got 6,000, 5,000, and 3,000. If the discount rate is 5%, the MPV of the project is closest to. So this is going to be strictly um, using our cash flows function on the calculator. So let's just punch these numbers in and uh, get our answer. So our cash flow zero is going to be that 10,000 initial outlay. So we'll be at 10,000. Um, and that'll be a negative number. So press our enter. Cash flow one is that 6,000. Press enter again. Go down to cash flow two, and we've got 5,000. And last but not least, we've got that last cash flow at 3,000. So we press enter. Make sure we don't have anything else in the calculator, which we don't. Um, We've got MPV uh, discount rate of 5, press enter, and then we can scroll down to our MPV and compute. And we see we've got 2840.9. We'll round up and go with answer A. Question 33. <clears throat> Mr. Roy is planning to invest 150000 in a home decor business. The cash inflows are as follows. First year... 35,000, second year 55,000, third year 75,000. Cost of capital is 7%. The IRR of the business is, so we've got 0, 4.37, and 7. Um, and then it's kind of just saying, hence whether Roy should or should not invest in the business. So let's pull up our, cat, our uh, calculator here, and we're going to be using that cash flows function. I've plugged all the numbers in, but we'll walk through it. Um, so we go into our cash flows here. So we're investing 150,000 up front. So that's going to be our first number minus 150. Um, cash flow in year one will be positive 35. Cash flow in year two positive 55. In year three we've got 75. So then from here we want to know the IRR. So we're just going to click that IRR button. And I already I had already hit compute, but you'd hit the compute button, and we get 4.3679. So we will go with answer B. Question 34. The cash flows from a project are presented in Exhibit 1. Uh, we've got our years here and our cash flows. We've got one outflow here at the beginning for our investment and then um, positives the rest of the way. The IRR of the project is closest to. So we're going to be using our calculator here to calculate um, our answer. So we're going to go into the cash flows function. I put all the numbers in, in here so you don't have to watch me type them out. So we've got our minus 22,000 for year zero. And then just going down the line, cash flow one, 5,000, cash flow two, 10,000, cash flow three, 3,000, cash flow four, 6,000, and lastly, cash flow five. And then from here, we just uh, punch in IRR and hit compute and we've got 52787 and we can see here we've got C 5.28 if we uh, round up. So something with the cash flows function is just always make sure you're hitting enter after you're putting your number in. Um, if you hit 2000 and then just scroll down you can see it doesn't actually change it so we want to make sure we hit our enter number in order to uh, save that value. <laughs> And before you start, always hit second and uh, clear work. Resets everything to zero. Make sure you don't have any 
previous work in there that could be messing up the calculation. Question 35. A firm's number of days payable is 69 days compared to an industry average of 45 days, so pretty significantly higher. Which of the following is the most appropriate interpretation of this discrepancy? A. The firm might be taking too long to pay its payables. This could certainly be an interpretation um, of this. They're taking almost uh, 25 days longer than the industry average to pay their payables, um, so they're certainly taking a lot longer. B. The firm's payable turnover ratio is higher than the industry's payable turnover ratio. So we're gonna. I'm just gonna bring in um, the formula for that quick and show that this that we can uh, get rid of this answer. Um, so we're going to do 365 over the day's payables to get our turnover ratio. Um, so we can see here the firm, we're doing 365 divided by 69 and then 365 divided by 45 for the industry. So the firm's is obviously lower at 5.3 about and industry at 8.1. So we can go ahead and cross off B since it is higher. And then C, the firm's higher days of payables imply that its suppliers have higher creditworthiness compared to the industry. The supplier's creditworthiness really isn't relevant in this case because um, we're the ones that, the firm is the one that owes the money, not to the suppliers, uh, rather than the other way around. If it said, uh, it implies that the firm has higher creditworthiness, then, you know, that's where we might, um, that could potentially be an uh, answer for us. If they had higher creditworthiness than that, then maybe their suppliers or um, they'd be allowed to take a longer time to pay. Um, but long-winded way to uh, say that that doesn't really matter. The supplier's creditworthiness isn't really relevant to accounts payable, and we'll go with A. Question 36. A project has the following characteristics. So we've got our initial investment here, expected post-tax cash flow from year 1 to 5. And then we've got debt to equity, target debt to equity, cost of equity, cost of debt, and effective tax rate. The net present value of the project is closest to. So this, there's going to be two parts to this question. Um, first, we're going to need to calculate the weighted average cost of capital um, for this project. So we have a discount rate to calculate that NPV. <laughs> And then we're going to be using going to the calculator for that cash flows function, um, putting in our cash flows, and then discounting by that weighted average cost of capital that we get. So I've done the calculation here, and we'll just pull this in so we can walk through it. Um, so it's going to be the weighted average cost of our equity and our debt. So I start off with the equity here. So we've got 12.5% as our cost of equity, and then with a target debt to equity ratio of 0.5, that's going to indicate um, that we have, let's say, $50 of debt and then $100 of equity. Um, so the overall amount there is going to be 1.5. So to get the weighting of equity, we do 1 divided by 1.5, which is going to be 0.67 rounded. Um, and then we'll t to get the cost of debt here, we're going to do that 11%. And we need to take into account taxes since interest is uh, deductible. So we do 1 minus that tax rate to get 0.6. So that's going to be our cost, of, our effective cost of debt. And then weight that by uh, the 0.33 that we had. So we get 10.53333, continuing on here. So next let's pull up our calculator we can use this to find the second part of the answer so like I said we're gonna pull up that cash flows function <clears throat> for cash flow zero we're gonna have minus 75,000 for that initial investment and then for the first cash flow period we'll put 22,000 and then the nice thing that we can do here is since the cash flows are the same each year um, for that cash flow one this is indicating frequency, so it occurs five times, so we can just put a five in here, and then we don't need to put anything else in the other uh, cash flow spots. So then from here, we're going to do that NPV, take that 10.5333, 3, 3, 
and uh, plug that in as our discount rate. Um, scroll down and it will hit MPV. So we get 7273, um, which is a little off, but if you look in the uh, answer booklet provided, they um, we just rounded to, uh, the answer rounded to 10.55, but we had 10.53, so it's uh, ends up pretty close, but we go with, we'll go with uh, answer B. Question 37. Which of the following real options is most likely an example of a sizing option? So real options are um, going to be similar to derivatives in the sense that um, basically it's going to be applied to management decision making where management has the right but not the obligation, um, which is where it's similar to a financial derivative, to start or continue any business endeavor or project they're kind of working on. Um, so looking at these, we've got price setting options, abandonment option, or production flexibility options. So A and C, price setting and production flexibility, these are going to both be examples of flexibility options, um, which relate more so to adjusting operations. Um, price setting option is going to let management increase or adjust prices according to market demand and kind of similar to, similarly to production they'll be flexing, flexi um, having the flexibility to adjust that. A sizing op option is going to be more a type of option where a company can either keep going on a project and dump more money into it if it's becoming a good success, or they can abandon it um, if it's not going well and kind of cut their losses, so to speak. So that abandonment option falls more so into that, whereas A and C are going to be um, fall into that flexibility category. Question 38. An investor buys 100 shares of a stock on margin at $146 per share using an initial margin of 50%. The price at which he will receive a margin call if the position's maintenance margin requirement is 40%. Um, so I'm going to pull in our formula here. And so just as a reminder... Initial margin is going to be the capital we need to put up in the beginning, and then maintenance margin will be the ongoing re um, required capital in order to uh, keep our loan intact. So our margin call price is essentially the stock price at which it would need to fall to in order to get a margin call where we need we would need to put up more capital. Um, so our debt is going to be in the uh, numerator and that debt is basically going to be um, our 146 per share and you can multiply it by the 100 if you want um, but that's going to be multiplied by that initial margin so essentially we're taking 73 dollars on margin or on a loan and then we're putting up 73 dollars of equity to buy this um, to buy a share and then in the denominator, we're going to have one minus the uh, maintenance margin requirement. So that's going to be the ongoing requirement we need. Um, so let's pull in our answer here, and we'll see that gives us that initial share price, 146 times 0.5. Um, and then in the denominator, one minus that 0.4 uh, maintenance margin gives us 121.67. Uh, we'll go with answer C. Question 39. Which of the following is the appropriate term for the discount rate that makes the present value of expected incremental after-tax cash flows <coughs> equivalent to the initial cash outlay? So A, net present value. We can go ahead and rule this one out right away. Um, net present value is the present value of the cash inflows minus cash outflows. It's not going to be a discount rate, which is kind of which is what we're looking for. B, opportunity cost. Uh, this is not going to be our answer either. Opportunity cost is a loss of potential gain in some alternative activity or action we could have taken um, to make money or use our capital differently. Um, so it's going to be due to a choice we make not really, uh, it's not going to be a discount rate for cash flows. <laughs> Uh, so that leaves us with C, internal rate of return, um, which is correct, and this is basically the definition for internal rate of return. Um, 
the discount rate that makes the present value of cash flows of expected incremental after tax cash inflows equivalent to the initial cash outflow. So we'll go see. Question 40. Consider a par bond priced at $1,110 and has a modified duration of 4.562. In response to a 0.5% increase in the yield to maturity, the price of the bond should most likely fall by... Uh, approximately 0.002281%, fall by approximately 2.281%, or rise by approximately 0.02281%. Uh, so we're going to be using the uh, modified duration here and the change in the yield to maturity. <laughs> um, and so right off the bat here, we know that if we have an increase in yield to maturity, the price of the bond is going to um, decrease since those bond prices move inversely to yields. So right away we can go ahead and uh, click off that uh, rise option. Um, so it's going to be fall by either this amount or this amount. So let's pull in our formula here. This one's uh, pretty straightforward. Um, so we've got approximate change in the bond price yield is going to be that modified duration and it's going to be negative since um, kind of what we just mentioned where yields go up or down, it's going to be an inverse um, relationship. And then multiplied by that uh, uh, yield to maturity change. Um, and this should say like yield to maturity change. So that we're going to plug in our 0.5% increase. So this will be a positive number. So we pull in our answer here. And we see we've got... Uh, minus 4.562, which is that modified duration, and then we're multiplying it by 0 0.005, gives us minus 0 0.02281. Uh, this is where it gets a little tricky because we might be inclined to choose A, 0 0.02281, but these answers here are in percentages. Um, so to get the percentage amount, we need to multiply this by 100, um, which would give us B fall by approximately 2.281%.